Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Olivia Snedden. Interlude this week. We're taking a break. We read, like, what, three, four books in a row? Yeah, something. Think, something like that. Yeah. I do want to address last week's episode, though. Last week's episode was the shortest episode we've had in a long, long time. Um, I, I don't, I don't, are you tracking minutes too? Is there a spreadsheet with minutes? Yeah. So if you talk for a few minutes, I'll probably have. Yeah. My guess is this is probably not counting like readings we went to where we broke it up, you know, like you got two readers in one episode, another, but actual episodes where we hosted, like, like where we were here the whole time, it's probably number two or three. Um, I could think of one off the top of my head that's shorter, and it's from an interview series we did <laughs> eight years ago. I know that one probably clocked in at about 19 minutes. It had nothing to do with the quality of the book or my mood or Rob's mood or anything else. Internet difficulties made it super hard to get that episode done. At one point, I just like screamed fuck in frustration and was like, the sooner we get this over with, the better, because it completely ruined my mood. So we put out an episode that was only 32 minutes long, and I'm a little I'm a little embarrassed about that one. That <laughs> so I'm looking at our list of of episodes, and I have all the dur- durations listed. Um, if we pull away the live readings and interviews, because like um, one of the big exceptions is going to be when we did those warmed and bound interviews, we had to do mm-hmm. 17 interviews in 17 days. So we weren't putting down like two and a half hour interviews every time. It was like 28 to 35 minutes usually, I think for those. Yeah. So if you pulled all of that out of the way, take away the live readings where we kind of took a chunk of a bigger recording and put it out as an episode and all that, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Um, yeah. Uh, it is the, yeah, it's the second shortest episode. <laughs> so what was what was shorter than that? Uh, well, the interview. You want to oh, talk? gotcha. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I got that okay. one interview you were referring to. Yeah. Um, in an effort to make me feel better, though, Rob did point out a different statistic from last week that that I'll let him share. Yeah. So even though the episode uh, ran a little short, uh, and again, mostly due to um, some shoddy internet, uh, we did actually do a spoiler talk for that book that came in it clocked in around 18 minutes long so if you add the episode and the spoiler talk together it's actually pretty close to what our common like our average episode duration is and that did make me feel better because it occurred to me that the people who contribute at patreon.com slash booked essentially got a full episode <laughs> and the rest of you guys didn't yeah so um if you're concerned about the duration of last week's episode there is exactly one person you have to blame, and that's yourself. Exactly. So thank you, Rob. That made me feel much, <laughs> much, much better. If I'm good at um, rationalizing things yeah, to myself. No. <laughs> now, we're faced with another conundrum because we're doing an interlude episode, and we got on now 15, 20 minutes ago to kind of you know get ready to go. And we're chit-chatting, and it occurred to us that we had, didn't have a whole lot to talk about. So the goal is to run longer than the 32 minutes that we ran last week. <laughs> So what do you think, Rob? Do we have 33 minutes in us this week? Um, yes. And uh, to get it started, I'm going to talk. I'm going to do a key update conversation. Oh, this okay. is my first. I have two ambushes for Livia so far that I've thought of this episode, and this is my first one. So I'm counting. Uh, I, depending on how you do the math, we we're either the ninth or tenth week into the year, and we have... Uh, I think we're we're reading currently our sixth book of the year, which means that there's three or four that you should have read by now. So what are those books? So um, <laughs> I have read one book outside the podcast <laughs> um, this year, and that is uh, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. Hold on. I thought you told me that you were reading a book a week. I uh, believe what I said was that I was going to read 52 books this year, <laughs> which... Like you said, depending on how you do the math, could be one book per week, or there could be one week where I read like nineteen books. All right. So yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I got started a little late. Um, I do know, I do know what the next non-podcast book I'm going to be reading is, and it's probably going to be as soon as I'm done with next week's review, because the way we're looking at it, there's probably a little bit of a gap in there. Um, Catcoin. Are you familiar? No. Is it? 
No. <laughs> it is Frank Edler's newest book, oh. Cat Coin, which has to do with cryptocurrency and cats. This it sounds like I've heard that this was going to be a thing. I didn't know it was all it was a thing now. You may have listened to an episode of Booked that Frank Edler was on, and I believe he mentioned it on that episode. Gotcha. Yeah. Or maybe you didn't listen to that episode. Oh no, I listened to it. Okay. I've listened that to could... every episode of our podcast. <laughs> I gotcha. Even the um, ones it wasn't involved in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I think that's going to be next. I, I do. I have a little list uh, of books to get caught up, um, you know, on this, this 52 books this year. Um, yeah. Right now I'm at seven. I mean, that's one more than no, it's, I've read five. I'm reading my sixth. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm reading my six too. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'll get there. I'm only a couple weeks behind. Like I'm only like two books behind. I don't see this being a problem. Are you anticipating like a bunch of free time later in the year or something? Um, that... No, no. I mean, uh, God, I hate to say this. <laughs> um, the video game that I play, um, Call of Duty, uh, they came out with this thing where they have seasons. So there's like new things released and it's done like every two months. And I'm like smack dab in the middle of season two right now. So once I finish season two, like my video game playing will die down a little bit for about a month before season three starts. So it's going to be in those in those valleys that that I'll probably be able to to get caught up a little bit. All right. That's fair. I, I kind of want to dive right into my my second ambush. All right. Since we're talking about like the number of books we're reading this year and stuff like that. Um, we sometimes do what's called like throwback episodes where we read something that's not like currently released, but something that, you know, came out in the past that either we're personally interested in reading or has some sort of significance to it. Right. Yeah. I will say that when you said that I I got a little excited because I think all of our throwback episodes were actually like fun, good books. Well, this one I'm I'm interested. The reason that I'm going to, I'm going to say we should do this one is because I'm interested to see like, um, if it, holds up kind of okay um and i guess probably we'll have (laughs) we might have very different opinions on this but how have we never done a throwback for kiss me judas oh um i don't know how we haven't um it it, mm. (laughs) i've I've actually thought about it like i'm not kidding i've thought about reviewing kiss me judas on the podcast most recently when we um reviewed the sopranos and i had mentioned how no one should ever write without quotation marks right and that was one of the books you referenced yeah yes so (laughs) even then i thought um we should here's what i'd like to do um i don't even know if this is like podcast consumable or not i I want to interview will christopher bear and i know that he dropped out of polite society it's been like 10 years now i think or, or something along those lines I mean, with stuff that we have coming up this year, God, I hate, all right, I'm going to go into a little bit of a longer spiel. (laughs) With the things that we have at least like soft commitments to, I'll call them, or some road to this year, I feel like, like everything else is downhill. Like on my personal list, by the end of this year, we'll have achieved like all the personal heroes and I know heroes is a strong word, but you know what I mean? Like the people that I've really wanted to talk to, um, there's still people I want to talk to, um, whose book I first read, you know, six weeks ago or, or, or whatever. But I had this list in my head, like F Paul Wilson is on that list, right? Uh, Mark Z. Danielewski, Craig Clevenger. I mean, there are some people that I've been ridiculously excited about having on the podcast from a personal standpoint. Well, Christopher bears on that list. Only I know that's unlikely, but I would still really like to get that done. And that's somehow in my mind when I thought we would read and review Kiss Me Judas is when we had an in to do that. (laughs) So what if uh, what if the review is what sparks the interest in the in the interview and we haven't been getting the interview because we've never done the review? Um, I, I am willing to do a throwback up. So for Kiss Me, Judas, I've read it, I think, four times. I'm happy to read it a fifth time for this <laughs> podcast. The only book I've read more than Kiss Me, Judas, I'm pretty sure. The Bible? is uh, 
Super Fudge by Judy Oh my Blue, god, yeah. Hell yeah. Which, which I probably read a dozen times, so I don't think that there's going to ever be a book <laughs> I've read more than Super Fudge. And quite honestly, I don't even know what I would talk to Judy Bloom about. Um, <laughs> so always welcome, Judy Bloom, if you're listening you want on the podcast. <laughs> Just shoot us an email. Yeah, I would fucking uh, be so excited to talk to Judy Bloom. I just don't know, like, like you know what I mean. But yeah, um, yeah I, I kiss me, Judas is a no brainer. Um, I'm looking at my copy on the shelf, mm-hmm. which may or may not be signed by Will Christopher. Is it Bear. signed? I don't have a signed copy. Such a weird thing. This was gifted to me by somebody who said, "I'm not 100 percent sure if this is his signature or not." Just so, gonna assume it is. It was uh, it was purchased from uh, from the internet and uh, gifted to me by somebody. I wish I had friends that fucking gave me signed books. I don't know if that's ever happened. I'm pretty sure, right? Somebody has had to give you a sign. Jesse hasn't given you any signed books. That guy, that guy's like funded half your library. Um, I'm gonna have to go through and double check. I, all right, so I can't say for sure that no one's ever given given me a signed book. I mean, all right. So a girl I dated. We just talked about these the other day. I found a, a a first edition, first printing of Lamb by Christopher Moore, and mm-hmm. uh, a girl I was dating years and years ago gave me a a special like Bible ish kind of copy of Lamb that was signed. Oh, like you could door. buy signed Christopher Moore books off of like a fucking website, so that's not super yeah. special. I've got some for sale because we met him in Milwaukee a few years ago. So if you want to buy a copy, yeah, anything signed, Dude. yeah, let me. I'll I'll print out the picture that we took of him and sign that if someone wants there to buy go. it. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I just feel like like if we do Kiss Me Judas, it's going to take us down the rabbit hole. Where we got to do the other two books? I mean, you know, there's some interesting <laughs> contrasts in there because he wrote those three books and all three of them are written in, in, in fairly distinct styles. Sure, sure. They're very different from one another. So I, I don't know. Yes, I thought you were going to say Winky. Because we actually got copies oh, yeah, of Winky specifically for that for that purpose, so um, I guess um, what we're saying to you listeners is, if we have some kind of flub where any of this stuff falls through between now and July, you're likely to hear "Kiss Me, Judas" or "Winky" as throwback episodes. <sighs> Winky is one of those books where, like Winky, uh, the author is Clifford Chase. Um, the book came out probably early two thousand, early two thousands, maybe. Mid two thousand, right? Did you just get? Is there a ghost? Is there a poltergeist in your room? I pulled the book off my shelf, and another oh. book came out with it and hit the floor. I was worried about some paranormal activity. Uh, Wiki um, is a book that Livius recommended to me pre podcast, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but I have no idea how you discovered this book. It's not the kind of book that like had national acclaim or anything like that. It seems like it was pretty under the radar. But Livius had a, a tendency to find these weird ass books. Uh, Two thousand and five was the release on Winky. Um, you know, I don't know specifically on this one. What I can say is that a lot of times it was just hours spent in the library, just pulling books and reading inlay cards. And before dust Amazon was a thing, you actually went to a, a physical. For the kids out there, who don't know what a library is. It's a building full of books. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I spent lots, lots of time at the library. I mean, like lots of time, like library trips were typically like one to two hours and they could be sometimes twice a week. It's like the cutest shit I've heard all day. Like I just, I with, like modern Livius who doesn't even want to like leave the house. I can't imagine you being like, well, I'll be at the library if you need me. I, I man, I, th- I think I told this story before on the podcast. So, I mean, I grew up going to the <laughs> Chicago public library. Um, and then I moved out to the suburbs. And when I moved out to um, Mundelein, Illinois, for anybody who's or has some idea about the geography of Illinois, um, I went to the Mundelein Library, and it was kind of sad and still at the time. They've since like built another library. Mm-hmm. Um, but someone said, oh, you've got to try the Cook Memorial Library, which is uh, Libertyville's library. Mm-hmm. I absolutely fell in love with that place. That place had – and there's like a weird backstory like um, – Someone from the Cook family left them a lot of real estate, which apparently they just sell off when they need money. So they're they're just rolling in dough. So much so that I was in there once. I don't remember exactly what it was. I was looking for a book, and they had like the second book in the series, but not the first. 
so I talked to one of the librarians and I said, Hey, can you see if you guys can get this from another library or whatever? And she says, Oh, none of, none of the libraries we, we like work with have this book. And she goes, I'm going to put it in an order to buy it for you. <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, no, that seems really like a lot. Like I was just happy they would get books from other libraries for me. And they're like, Oh no, no, we have so much money. We're never going to be able to spend it. <laughs> And like three weeks later, I got a phone call saying that the book I had on hold was in and I didn't have anything on hold. And when I went there, they had bought a copy of that book to loan it to me. So basically they bought a whole book just so one guy could read it and give it back to them. Yeah. But when you think about it, it made sense because if they had the second book in the series. Right. Like, yeah, you totally know, makes sense. yeah. So anyway, um, but yeah, God, I love that place. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, and then, yeah, Amazon. And now I don't remember the last time I was in the library. <laughs> don't really see myself going into the library ever again, to be really honest. What a fucking change of events. You decide to start reviewing books and that's when you stop going to libraries. Yeah, pretty much. Um, pretty, pretty much. So that's exciting. We might do some Will Christopher Bear this year. You know what? Now that I think of it, we do that Patreon pick thing where if you're spending 10 bucks a month or more with us, you get to mm-hmm. pick a book that we do for a review. I can't believe that in all the times that we've had books to review, no one has had us read Kiss Me Judas. Doesn't that seem weird? Yeah, that does seem a little weird. You know what? And we could take this offline for a conversation, but that might be one that we get a, a guest reviewer for. I absolutely was thinking the same thing. All right. We'll, uh, we'll move on um, from that. <laughs> Uh, I know this dropped like probably the day after we recorded our other episode, um, which again was super short, but, uh, the, the 2019 Bram Stoker awards final ballot came out. Um, we talk about it every year. We are not, we are not going to read all all of the books this year. Like we did last year. (laughs) Um, but I was, you know, it was nice. We were already two fifths of the way there, which is, I believe where we were last year. Yeah, when we, when we decided to read all of them. Yeah, last year we picked up the books uh, The Hunger by Alma Katsu, mm-hmm. Glimpse by Jonathan Mayberry, and The Pandora Room by Christopher Golden. Because mm-hmm. we'd already read... Fuck, whatever. Something, something. Other, thing two other read. books. <laughs> <laughs> probably a Trembley book, probably a Stephen Graham Jones book, who knows. Yeah, what? Uh, you know you said that, and look, uh, The Pandora Room was fine. <laughs> But how the fuck did that wind up in the finals for the Bram Stoker Awards? Well, that's... Didn't we... Uh, I completely forgot if we figured out who votes for this shit. Um, I think it's members of the, the HWA. Uh, so maybe... Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're not... Maybe maybe that's the thing. If you're a horror writer, you don't necessarily have good taste in horror fiction? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, we'll go through a couple of the categories uh, for, for this year, and uh, I'll, I'll kick it off right at the top. <laughs> so um, we've read two two out of these five. So Chuck Wendig Wanderers, um, nominated for Superior Achievement in a Novel, mm-hmm. and uh, Josh Mallerman Inspection, uh, also nominated. I know between those two which one I would vote for were I a voting member of the HWA. I'm pre- I, pretty sure everybody knows. Yeah, Uh, you, if you had to pick between the two that you read? Well, here's the thing. If you want to think about it, like this is the Stoker Awards and it's the Horror Writers Association. I don't see a lot of horror. I see why it would qualify the Wanderers book, but I don't see it as being a horror book. I mean, at, you know, more closer to like psychological thriller or, or something like that, but not necessarily horror. Like, I just don't see it that way. Mm-hmm. And the argument could be made that inspection also doesn't really bring the horror so much, but like there's at least one chapter that definitely qualifies. <laughs> yeah. So I would agree with you on, on both of those that neither one come to my mind when I think horror novels. However, um, of the two, I know which one I would choose. It's instruction. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, the other three, uh, that are, uh, finalists um coyote rage um, which is published by independent legions publishing and that is owl going back is the name of the author 
Um, S.P. Miskowski, The Worst is Yet to Come, and that's from a Terpidid, mm, Terpidatio Publishing. Trep, it's Trepid. Trep, Trepidatio, Trepidatio. <clears throat> It just flows off the tip of the tongue. Yep. S.P. Miskowski, <laughs> The Worst is Yet to Come, and Lee Murray, Into the Ashes by Severed Press. Um, Lee Murray, who was kind enough to host um, the panel that we were on at StokerCon a couple of years ago. Yeah. Mar- Lee Murray. Uh, mm-hmm. Definitely, uh, like, super nice and, and fun to hang out with. So, For sure. Um, we're not going to talk about every category because there's probably not much that like, here's the thing. We haven't read all this stuff. Um, so we we're probably going to speak best about the things that we already know about. Um, there's superior achievement in a first novel usually will hit like one, you know, we'll probably know like one of the people based on, I feel like baby teeth yesterday, last year was one of the candidates. Um, I do know Sarah Reed, the bone weavers orchard is a, a, a writer that's in our kind of sphere but um, it's not a book that I've read. Um, the other names I am not familiar with. Yeah, um, Sarah Reed has two nominations. The other one is for collection, maybe. Hmm. It is out of water. Also from Trepidatio Publishing. <laughs> Trepidatio. <laughs> it's got to be Trepidatio, right? Trepidatio. Well, trepidation. Trepid. Dacio? Mm. Maybe they just forgot to put the N on the end of the word. Oh, somebody's just copying and pasting this it's all over the page. It's a terrible typo, and it's making us look like yeah. we're trying to like speak Italian yep. or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. In in fiction collection is that Out of Water by Sarah Reed, Paul Tremblay, Growing Things, and Other Stories. And Kate Jones with Lady Bits, also from that same publisher. Oh, Kate Jones. Yeah. Hmm. Hopefully... Uh, better author than stoker con coordinator i i, I hope so <laughs> um screenplay we should talk about oh screenplays. yeah i always love so, these yeah i'm not going to go through the names because who knows who these people are but uh midsummer mm-hmm. um stranger things season three chapter eight the battle of star court i actually think i know which episode that is uh the lighthouse a movie that i believe yeah, you saw i did see that um, Doctor Sleep, also a movie that you saw on said was really good, and I still haven't gotten to it. How how dare you? All right. Uh, well, you know, here's the problem. I Too busy playing Call of Duty or whatever. Well, that. Um, <laughs> I have to get that director's cut because I actually saw someone second your opinion on the director's cut. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, in an article online. Oh, cool. And then Jordan Peele with Us, which I also did not see. Well, and you have a. You have a grudge against Jordan Peele because of Twilight <sighs> so <laughs> Oh my God! Let's let's talk about Jordan Peele for a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting at work, um, you know, on a company approved break, just in of case course. anyone's listening. And uh, I, I scrolling through the the Google news feed, and and it says Candyman trailer out, and I vaguely <laughs> remember hearing somewhere that there's there's a a, a remake of Candyman. So I put on and I'm watching the trailer and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know what? This looks okay. I mean, I, I love Clyde Barker. I love the original Candyman movie. This looks all right. And then towards the end, it just pops up from Jordan Peele. <laughs> and I was like, oh, the motherfucker that ruined the Twilight Zone is now trying to ruin fucking Candyman. So I am so torn. Like, I was so excited mm. about this. And now I'm like, ah, oh. the last thing they gave him to reboot was a fucking nightmare. Not not in a good way. Like if Candyman was a nightmare, that'd be great. Just the not the kind of nightmare you're looking for. No, no. So I'm a little yeah. I have not seen Get Out or Us. I mean, it had, they both have a lot of acclaim. I just haven't like dedicated the time to those, so I can't have an opinion about. I did watch the first three episodes of Twilight Zone, and was not super impressed. Yeah, uh, I, I did see Get Out, and I thought it was okay. That yeah. being said, I thought it was okay. Like people were like, "This this should win the Oscar," and I thought, "God, I didn't see anything that remotely resembled Oscar worthy." It, it was it was a good movie. Um, it just wasn't anything that. Yeah, yeah. So that makes me think of like I've been thinking about this a lot lately with um, like modern kind of cultural things that happen, and like you know how there's like a challenge for everything. 
It was like the bird box challenge. We were supposed yes. to drive with a blindfold on, which is like the dumbest thing ever. Mm-hmm. Well, there was one where <laughs> I haven't seen Get Out, so I don't understand this. But there was one where the challenge, the Get Out challenge, was like running full full speed at a camera and then like turning at the last minute. Oh God, I missed this one. Yeah. So apparently, there's a scene similar to that in the movie Get Out. And so, like, people were recording videos of them just, like, booking it at a camera and then at the last minute just turning away, like, and not hitting the camera. That, I mean, and that's where we are in society. If there's something that is, like, memorable or that stands out about anything, you have to just record yourself doing that thing and post it on social media. That's what that's what it is now. That's where we're at. Uh, that's... <laughs> yeah, you know, but th- here's how I feel about those things. So I, I'm most of them like this is dumb, but every now and then when I catch, them, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And then a week later, I'm like, enough. Like the first couple <laughs> people that did it, it was cool. I'm like, all right, that's clever. It's cute. Yeah. If if you are like a week or two post premiere of whatatever challenge is, just don't do it. Yeah, just there, don't. Do it. There was an ice bucket challenge where you're like, I can't watch another fucking ice bucket challenge. Yeah, yeah. So, um. Uh, yeah, that's about it for the Stoker Awards. I don't know if there's anything else we really need to slash want to talk about. No, I, and I wonder. So, like, there's there's a category called Superior Achievement in an anthology, and I feel like, um, I don't know the history of who has won this award, but I feel like if Ellen Datlow is on the list, just give it to her, right? Are we are we in agreement <laughs> on that? Like, I mean, yeah, uh, saga anthology and ghost stories. Um, like, <laughs> well, like I look at this and, and I think in looking at the, at the, the titles, like it, this is the, the horror writers association, right? So like great ghost stories versus, I don't know, Jennifer Brozek, but her, her anthology is called the secret guide to fighting elder gods. Like it just doesn't strike the same Sounds a little fantasy as, yeah, as a ghost thing. Um, Pop the Clutch, Thrilling Tales of Rockabilly Monsters and Hot Rod Horror by Eric Guignard. My Maybe? first thought about that is how did we not, how did David James Keaton not have a story in there and how do we not re- review it? That's true, yeah. And then <laughs> um, Robert S. Wilson, Knox Paradid- oh, man. Peri- I, I, Periadelia? Sure. Um, I don't even know what that is. So based on, on titles alone, I would have to give it to Ellen Datlow because hers is about just straight up ghosts. I mean, it sounds the most applicable. I'm going to look up Periodelia. So um, we will be covering... Search. We will be covering the winners um, and the losers um, when the 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 final ballots are in. Um, not going to StokerCon this year. No. Um, well, that was the UK one. Yeah, I know. That we wanted to, and then... Um, we found out it was in Scarborough, England. Yeah, not it's like not in a cool London. part of England. Right. I probably spell, I probably pronounced it wrong. Peridolia? Peri- Peridolia? Hmm. It's kind of where you, like, if you see something, and, it rem- and like, you, you see a pattern in it that, like, is a thing. So, like, if you're looking at your ceiling tiles and you see a face in it... Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Like, you recognize something in a pattern that looks like something that you're... Like it, it, it reminds you of something else. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I probably spent way too much time talking about that. But that's okay. <laughs> um, by the <sighs> way, Scarborough, UK, is a five-hour drive from London. I wonder where that is in comparison to where, like, our buddy uh, Craig Walwick lives. Craig Walwick. Um, I, I, uh, he's in Stratford. I think he's in Stratford, or he's close to Stratford. Von Stratford on Avon upon Avon something. <laughs> it was um, weird, like British yeah. names for places. Three hours and eighteen minutes, if that's where he's at. I don't think I think he's near there though. Uh, it's still yeah. I mean, it yeah. doesn't seem like a lot. That'd be like us driving to Milwaukee, or like, all right, it'd be like us driving to Madison, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. or something. But still, well, we'd have to fly seven right. hours. I'm not flying across yeah. the goddamn ocean just to drive alive. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's part of the issue. So although I think it's cool, and it's got to be really cool, because you have to think for people who are in the UK that are part of the Horror Writers Association. Yeah. You're right. It's like them driving to, like, whatever, Indianapolis or, or for us or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 
so yeah if we lived there we'd totally go that being said it's a really long flight i think I... now you need it now you need a visa because the uk is no longer part of the oh because of brexit and all that shit that finally went yeah. through. yeah yeah i don't know if they started that but i believe that that was one of the things that you would actually need a visa to travel to um, england where you didn't previously but even though that's that far we can't even make it to the stuff that's close to us and sometimes yeah not 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 due to our own fault so i'm pretty sure c2e2 is in rosemont right the rosemont convention center or whatever well that's what i thought and that's where i started feeling guilty it's actually at the mccormick place oh okay all right so to be fair that is like an hour and 20 minutes from us yeah, it's, um, it's not a quick drive. I mean, I guess if you take 290 all the way, you just go in and like, burp, 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 like whatever. Yeah, so C2E2 is um, probably stands for something, but it's a, it's a comic book convention. Chicago which, Comic yeah. and Entertainment Expo. So C-C-E-E, yeah. C2E2. Yeah. So, you know, that sounds like fun to me, but it's like 50 bucks to get in, you know, and they're super crowded and, and I just don't like it enough. I mean, I like that kind of stuff. Not that I read comic books, but I like the artwork, and I think that those those things do have some some cool factors to them. Um, an unexpected cool factor, though, is that you go on social media and you see that Josh Mallerman is at C two E two, like not like there to like hang out, but with like an actual booth. And then you go, well, what the fuck is this? Nobody told us. You didn't know, did you? Uh, I did not know. Yeah, I didn't know either, or I might have dropped 50 bucks and said, we should go to C2E2, maybe get to meet Josh Mellerman. But that didn't happen. Nobody told us, and so um, Josh kind of like, uh, I don't know if it was the day before, it was either Friday, we're recording on a Sunday, so this is either Friday or Thursday night, I don't remember which, he basically said like, either I'm in Chicago or I'm headed to Chicago, and it's like, bitch, I've got a job, like I've got things to do i got books to read you can't just drop he didn't say it to me but like he put it on social media and of course <laughs> i took that as a direct message to hey rob yes come see me yes. at c2e2 um and yeah so saturday and sunday he was doing uh autographing and panels uh in promotion of mallory the the second bird box book um at c2e2 and we just found out about it like like as it was going down essentially and i take i took it personally i had a little cry i got past it i just want to go back to something you said i'm not i'm not done talking about c2e2 but you said it like you've ever said no to anything because you're reading a book and i don't (laughs) think that's accurate (laughs) there are times where i'm pretty sure you're like oh i really need to read this book but i'm on season three episode four justified so i'm gonna watch that first and then I'm gonna uh, read this book. Yeah, that's probably pretty fair. Um, now that you say that, the job part I get, I, I, I believe you on the job part. Right. I know you. Well, I mean, I was trying to be dramatic, like, and you're really yeah, just taking all the wind out of that particular sale. <laughs> um, so, all I'm saying is, give me a little heads up. And it's not just Josh Mallerman. There are apparently other literary types at the fucking comic book convention. Yeah. Well. All right, so let's talk about that because I went to the C two E two website and I went to the literary guest section of the guest um, list. So I recognize Joe Hill's there, and we saw a picture of Josh with Joe Hill and Allison, Josh's wife, and then uh, someone else who I'm not familiar with. Um, and that's kind of where we're headed with this because besides Joe Hill and Josh Mallerman, I can't find a name of a person that I know. Now you've got me looking to see. I know. C2E2 guests. I'm pulling it up. Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, I'm scrolling through and there's a lot of people. There's probably like 30 people. And maybe I, I can't even recognize like the titles of the stuff that they're listed for. So I'm hoping that maybe Livius will pick out a name that I. All right, so like I recognize someone to the uh, novelization of the Rise of Skywalker, Ray Carson. She's there, but I never knew that. Like I didn't, I wouldn't have known her otherwise. Yeah, I've got nothing. Yeah. So, 
I think our instinct is right to not look at C2E2 as a place to like meet literary people. At least the literary people that we're interested in, I should say. The um what was the one that was in was it in San Francisco? That there was just a bunch of people were there. Um <laughs> Rob Hart was no Rob Hart, like Chuck Polinick. By the time I was done, I think um shit. Christopher Moore, maybe. All I know is I was like, oh, this is something we should have considered going to. But again, it was one of those things that I didn't see it until people started posting photos. Right. Yeah. You know what? Now that you say that, um, that that event sounds familiar, but I don't know what it is or who was there. I think it's that big, ridiculous one that um, they always debut, like the new Avengers movie. Like, oh, uh, well, Comic Con. That would have been San Diego. I think that's, yeah, maybe that's the one, San Diego. But yeah, no, I do not recognize any of these other people. That's not to say that they're not um, uh, terrific writers. Right. Um, just nothing really from, from mine and Rob's radar. Well, you know, I've probably heard the name John Scalzi before. That seems familiar. But. Yeah, John Scalzi, The Last Emperor, Old Man's War, autographing panels Friday, Saturday. Huh. So mm. next year we'll keep an eye out. Who knows? Maybe uh, Josh had a great time and uh, he'll come back. I'm willing to go to that. Oh, Terry Brooks. Terry, yeah, Brooks, Terry Brooks is an actual big deal. Yeah. 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 I just saw that now. Um, but yeah. sci-fi. Yeah. It's a big deal in sci-fi, which is really, you know. Meh. Which probably at C2E2 makes sense, but like, I don't know. Maybe we need to start looking at like, um, like con, like con lists, like guest lists. But like again, like realistically, we would have had to pay like fifty to seventy five dollars for a one day pass to hang out with Josh Mallerman and literally nobody else, unless we had the like ability to meet with Joe Hill. Yeah, but I don't know, like how likely. <laughs> That would have been. <laughs> well, so that's that's the weird thing. So someone like Josh, I'm sure we could have messaged and, and hung out with. But um, I did go to a comic book convention. And maybe it was C2E2 years ago with uh, with Joe Hammer and Dan Hines. Oh, wait. Wasn't and, that and... Exotica? Or did you not go to that one? No, I did not go to Exotica. We did, I did go to a comic book convention okay. with them. And like to meet any of the people was you stand in a line and you pay like whatever the rate is. So like 25 bucks to get an autograph or like 50 to get your picture taken um, with someone. And Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I don't know that there's any authors that I would pay to like get their autograph. And I'm not saying that because I I don't think there's anybody I would pay and like wait in line to get their autograph. Do you know what I mean? Like I just don't, the respect that I have for, for artists, um, be it authors or, or movie types or, or actors, whatever, um, just really doesn't extend to like, I want to wait in a line and, and drop 50 bucks to get my like photo taken with them. I, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't have it in me. Like I'd love to be able to have a conversation about their work with them, but like the, the, the photo op just doesn't, doesn't really do much for me. No. And we're stuck in this weird limbo that we're discovering from, uh, me going to the book expo that we're not like good enough to get free entry to things. Just not that some <laughs> shit. 470 goddamn episodes where we talk about books and we don't qualify as much as like a vlogger. So I don't know. Well, I mean, Bob's you know what? We do have a YouTube page. Maybe I should have really pushed the, you know, push the, you know, pushed it a little bit further. I yeah. didn't even think about it until now. Oh, well, <sighs> I need to stop drinking beer and start drinking water. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. I don't know how podcast worthy is this from a book <laughs> standpoint. <clears throat> Rob today tech shamed me via, uh, via a message he sent. And I am going to read you uh, this message. It says, I did something the other day you'd never, ever do. I bought a smart water bottle. <laughs> I did. I bought a smart water bottle. I have to be honest with you. I thought a lot about this after you sent me that message. And I thought to myself like, oh, maybe he can tell it to turn his lights on and off (laughs) or to open his garage door or to set the temperature to like, you know, whatever, 80 degrees or whatever. Rob likes his his, uh, little pad to be, you know, all all steamed up. And apparently it does none of those things. So, Rob, I have some questions. 
Hit me. I'm ready. I'm ready for what this. What the fuck is a smart water bottle? It's pretty much... Well, I was going to say it's exactly what you would think it is, but apparently <laughs> you think it controls everything. Um, you can use it to measure your water intake throughout the day, and you can set goals to make sure that you are taking in as much water as you should. Uh, and there's a social aspect where you can have other people who also have this water bottle. Um, you can see their progress throughout the day as well. I, I, I've got to be honest. Sounds a little hokey to me. So I'm going to ask some more questions and see if I can if I can suss this out. What is the, the, the price of this, this water bottle? I think it's like 60 bucks. Okay. To be fair... How? I got a discount and I had gift cards, so I didn't actually go out of pocket on it. I already had money, like, kind of on a gift card to spend on okay. it. So uh, I didn't go out of pocket for this water bottle, but it was like, you know, it ended up being like 55 bucks. Um, So how how exactly does it, I, I have an idea, but how, how does it track your, your water consumption? So there's a sensor in the middle of it that um can basically tell how much water is in the bottle. So when you fill the bottle... You have to let it sit on a flat surface for a few seconds so it can come, like, detect how much water is in there. And then every time you drink, you put it down on a flat surface, and after a few seconds, it detects how much water is gone. So I guess, like, the cheat would be you just pour it out <laughs> instead of drinking it. All right, so a couple of things. A, you know there are people doing that, right? Yeah, They're like, stupid well, people. I'm, that... lose, I'm not going to lose to Rob. I'm just going to fucking pour this shit out. Um, this this is an app though, right? Like you you it's yes, an app, not not like a digital readout on the bottle or anything. Right. Uh, good question. So for anybody who's listening who's interested in this, um, the bottle I'm using is the Hydrate Spark Three. This is absolutely not a product endorsement. It just happens to be the one I'm using, and you get the Hydrate app. You pair it blue, by via Bluetooth. Um, it's got a little like watch style battery in the bottom of it that apparently lasts a really long time. Um, and yeah, once you pair it. Uh, you tell on the app how many ounces you're supposed to drink in a given day. Um, since I know you're going to ask, I'm just going to tell you my current goal is one gallon of water a day, so 128 ounces. And then it just basically tracks every time you drink water, it updates your progress. All right, so while you were talking, I pulled this up on their website. Um, there's fucking lights in this thing? Yeah. It, it <laughs> so when I hit my 128 today... Like these green lights kind of like flashed like throughout, like up and down, like in like a fun, like celebratory pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what color bottle did you get? Did you get green? I got the white one. The white one. Okay. Um, for anybody who's interested in this, <laughs> everything Rob has said is true. It is fifty nine ninety five is the retail price. Um, again, this is de definitely not an endorsement. They did not pay us to, to do this, <laughs> <clears throat> but it's fucking sold out. <laughs> Well, so let me re let me reiterate to everybody, Rob bought a bottle to put water in that through an app tracks how much he drank. He spent almost 60 bucks on it. And to some people, that might sound ridiculous. Not not to me, but to other people, it might sound. And then I go to the fucking web page, and they're sold out. You can't even buy one of these, at least not directly from the manufacturer. <laughs> That's, um. I mean, maybe it's just a trend you need to jump on, Livius. Um, well, the bottle trend, I mean, is big because of, you know, the plastic and recycling and sure. stuff, right? So there have even been um, a famous um, instance where, where um, celebrities shaming each other over the use of plastic water bottles, right? There's Jason Momoa and one of the guys from the Avengers movie, I think, where Momoa called him out for a selfie in which he was holding a plastic water bottle. Oh, I missed that. But Aquaman, you would think Aquaman of any, of anybody. Yeah. Um, but like 60 bucks, dude. Like, I don't... <laughs> all right. So here's it's what I'm like... going to, my rebuttal is going to be, um, if you go to like, like some of the top, like reusable water bottle, like manufacturers, Mm -hmm. And you look at, so Hydro Flask is probably one of the most popular, most uh, used um, water bottles right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to their website right now. An 18-ounce standard mouth Hydro Flask bottle costs 
with no technology built into it at all. It's just a metal <laughs> bottle. You know what I'm saying? So like, no, no, I, I. It's funny because you, the way you said, with no technology <laughs> built into it, I just kept thinking like I never thought that a water bottle needed technology. Right. But well, yeah, that's I, where I we're mean, at now. Yeah. Dude, I was um, thinking about that today too. When like, I'm drinking from my bottle that that tracks my water consumption for me, and I go to my phone to like advance whatever youtube video that i'm watching on my tv and i realized that like i just changed the lighting in my my like living room using my phone that like the day that the internet goes down like the apocalypse starts is gonna be a real fucking like <laughs> shock Rob, rob's gonna fucking die of thirst in I'm the dark like, i don't know how much i've drank today did i drink too much every time i take a sip i'm gonna be like Am I going to be like that one chick on the radio that drank too much and died? Yeah, that Opie and Anthony, yeah. right? Is that, yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. Um, Chris Pratt, by the way, is who uh, Momoa was shaming for using a plastic water bottle. But we can't hold that against him, though, because he really likes velociraptors. That's a Jurassic World reference. Got it. Was Chris Pratt one of the Avengers? I don't think he's one of the Avengers. He, yeah, he is. He's uh, he's in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. He's um, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. He's Star, Star Lord. Lord. That's yeah. what it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So now my my <sighs> other question. This one makes my head hurt. How are you obtaining the water that goes into the smart water bottle? Oh, it's just from the tap. <laughs> okay. I don't because do I know fancy. there's people out there buying plastic fucking bottles and then pouring oh. them into the smart water bottle. Right. Completely. <laughs> Yeah, defeating the purpose. <laughs> um, you want to know what my progress for today is? Yeah, I'd love to. So it's 9 o'clock in the evening right now. So I should be kind of coming close to my 128 ounces goal. I'm currently at 147. Okay. Which is probably more water than you've had in 2020. Uh, yes. So uh, let me tell you that that is probably, <laughs> yeah, just in 2020. In 2019, um, I think I drank like four bottles of water. Wow, that's almost 80. That's probably 80 ounces. Yeah, yeah, it's four or five. Uh, it, there is a social aspect to it, so um, you can connect with other people who also have this bottle and like see your friends' progress uh, throughout the day. And so there's three people I'm connected with right now. And two of them aren't even at the 75% mark, which like, yeah, it's nine o'clock at night. You, you need to start drinking some water, buddy. Um, but I think my competitive edge is that um, since I'm up so late in the evening, like, it, like, like I'm up to like sometimes two in the morning and I'll pound a couple of bottles of water. So I'm starting out the day like 40 ounces deep and a 128 ounce goal. It's like, this is easy. <laughs> right? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm on this web page. <laughs> If you lose your bottle, you can also find my bottle on a map. What? Are you serious? Well, it says last connected location. Oh my god! Find my amazing. bottle is, is is an option. But again, I mean, because it's based on Bluetooth, it would probably just be like where you left it. Right. You, you right. know the what last I mean? Time it connected yeah. to your phone, basically. Yep. Yeah. Um, <sighs> yeah. I. Uh, it's it's uh it's cute. Does it have? Is it is it like insulated? Oh, like a like a hydro flask would be, no. Okay, it's a, I'm not it's, familiar it's, with a hydro flask. So. It's totally made out of plastic, mm -hmm. um, and so like the real, the focus. I opened it up right now, as if you can see inside. Uh, the real focus with this, so it's got kind of like a rubbery uh, exterior, and um, it's just all plastic. But um, did we did we not talk about the lights yet? Did we talk about the lights? We meant yeah, the celebratory okay, yeah, yeah. lights. Yeah, apparently yeah. it'll also light up to remind you. You yeah, need to drink according to their. If I'm if I'm running behind, I haven't been running behind yet, so I haven't seen the lights be like, "Hey, dude, what's going on?" Did you um? So did you pick that number? So I, I realized that this is this, this has gone way off the the rails from a podcast standpoint, <laughs> but I just saw that there's a personalized hydration goal that's calculated for you. Yes. So based on your body type and your age and all these types of factors, mm -hmm. it set a goal of 99 ounces for me. But, um, all right, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you the backstory. We're going way into this without telling you why I even did this. I think that once I tell you why I bought this bottle, you're going to be way more on board. <laughs> I can, I, I can hardly wait. I'm on, I'm at work and, uh, and this one 
like a few people I work with have this bottle and one of them was talking about how they missed their hydration goal the night before. And I looked at him and I was like, dude, how the fuck difficult is it to drink water? And he got real kind of, you know, salty with me about it. And then he accused me of not drinking enough water myself. Just, you know, like, how Mm -hmm. do you know how much water you're drinking? So basically I decided (laughs) in the most petty way possible to buy this bottle just to flex on this dude about how much I drink water every day. I would like to take back my sarcasm in the last comment I made because fuck that guy. I bought a bottle too. Right? You just I just wanted to show him <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah. And so yeah. it goes even further. Uh, <laughs> yesterday, <laughs> um, which was the first full day I had the bottle, uh, I sent uh, a screenshot of my water intake of 133 ounces at like 7 or 8 o'clock at night um, to my coworkers who had the bottle, including that dude. And uh, and I said, suck it, you thirsty bitches, because they were, like, way behind me. <laughs> so okay. now I'm in an email, or I'm now I'm on a text group thread titled The Hydrate Team, um, where I can just flex on them about how much I'm drinking. I'll be honest. <clears throat> I always thought there would be a day where I thought you would do competitive drinking. You didn't but think I never, <laughs> I never thought water Never, it never entered my mind that it would be water. Mm. Sorry, just had a drink of water. Um, the funny thing is, in that Hydrate Club, I guess it's called Hydrate Club, um, uh, message thread, I said I finally found something I can be competitive about, uh, water consumption. <laughs> um, there's nothing that would prohibit you from drinking beer out of it, though, right? No, not at all. Yeah. I think it just yeah. detects liquid, like a level yeah. of liquid. So if I got one, I could just fill it up with Diet Coke? Yeah. In which case, you would just, like, drink circles around us, I'm sure. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I was thinking about that because you were talking about 128 being your goal. Um, On an average day, I probably drink four Diet Cokes. Okay. Um, And one, like, 14-ounce cup of coffee. And that's (laughs) it. That's that's my, like, intake. That's all your liquids. liquids. Day. I mean, barring the, you know, went out to lunch the other day and I had a margarita. You know what I mean? But that's, you know, like more of a one-off. Yeah. So probably, what is that, 60? 65, maybe? Wait, how? Um, well, oh, if you're talking about like a 16 or whatever ounce or 12 ounce. Well, the cans are 12 ounce. I mostly drink out of cans. I, I will buy a bottle, you know, okay. if I'm out. But for work, I have, you know, just cases of Diet Coke that I buy. Um, plus I think I don't, whatever the second to highest Keurig setting is for a cup. So I think it's like 14 ounces maybe is the cup of coffee I drink in the morning. That's so, I mean like, so what you're telling us, you're saying without saying is that you're basically beef jerky on the inside. <laughs> no, you have no. like no water in your body. No, no, no. So 99% of Diet Coke is actual water. All right. I mean, I'm no, just concerned. Like, that's the actual, if you look, I'm looking at the can. The number one ingredient is uh, 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 carbonated water. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to the internet. I'm doing Livia-style internet searching right sure. now. absolutely. Can of soda. How much water is in a can of soda? <laughs> All 12 right. motherfucking ounces. How much water is in a 12-ounce can of soda is the question. The answer is exactly 12 ounces. I don't... That doesn't make sense to me. Sure. So, okay. <laughs> There's... Let me... And again, you know I'm not a huge science guy, but let, let me break down to you what, what I've done, because I've, I've had this discussion with people in the past. If you were dying, let's say you crawled out of the, the, the desert, right, out of the Sahara... And someone gave you a case of Diet Coke. You would drink the Diet Coke and you would become rehydrated. Now, there are some properties like caffeine is uh, is a little bit dehydrating, um, you know, that type of thing. Uh, <laughs> but the overwhelming majority of it is still going to hydrate you. So if you were to do a one-to-one and there was some way to measure this hydration, and I drank through whatever, 10 cans of Diet Coke and you drank through 120 ounces of water you would probably be like 1% more hydrated than I am. 
with none of the negative aspects of all the other shit that's in a can. Well, yeah, all right. So Diet <laughs> Coke's probably going to be fucking heart problems because of aspartame. But if we're talking about from a hydration standpoint, there's very all little right. difference. All yeah. right. So I'm going to go to – next time I go to the doctor, I'm going to be like, hey, my podcast co-host told me that hydration is no different between a can of, can of soda and a, and a straight water. And they'll be like, yeah, he's pretty much right. It, for all intents and purposes, yeah, there's there's a very <laughs> variation. Until you get in the stuff that's super super alcohol heavy, like the same does not hold true for like whiskey. But even beer will hydrate you if you are dehydrated. Hmm. You'll also get drunk. Well, so, um, okay. all I'm going to say is I'm sticking with the yeah. I'm not getting yeah. drunk off this water. The water is is is. I'm not debating that the water is not healthier. That's not, <laughs> that's not what I was trying to say. So, but again, it depends on where you get your water from, too. So, because water can kill you in some places on the planet. Yeah. Also, leading cause of drowning, and you're just willingly putting it in your body. I don't know if you know how drowning works. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, when I take in the water, I don't put it in my lungs. I'm putting right. it in my stomach. Huh? No, I Which know. I'm just drastically reduces the amount of drowning. <laughs> Simply stating a fact, the leading cause of drowning, <laughs> water. I can't fight that. I can't fight that. You know what? That kind of reminds me of the book that we're reading next week. Science. Yes. I think Rob's trying to rein it all in. We're not done. <laughs> we're not done. Oh, shit. There's we have more stuff to talk content. about? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was such a good segue, though. I could not take it. So Rob pointed out to me um, the other day that Clive Cussler died. So for those of you who don't know, Clive Cussler was a um, had men's adventure writer is probably, I think, a pretty, pretty good way to, to kind of sum up what, what he wrote. Sure. Um, responsible for 85 books, um, selling no fewer than 100 million copies. Um, died at the age of 88. I'll be honest, I thought Clive Cussler was dead already. Um, not the reason I'm bringing this up. Rob pointed out to me that the article, I'm not even going to name because I, I did a little bit of a deeper dive. I'm not even going to name the 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 source um, that Rob basically quoted and said, yeah, I read this article on this particular web page and they kind of shit talked his books, which uh, which wasn't cool. Okay. And I agreed with that. As a matter of fact, I made some disparaging remarks about the source that um, that Rob cited um, for this article. I went on to find <clears throat> at least four more that also kind of shit talked the guy's books, which I thought, you know, Rob said was in poor taste, and I agreed wholeheartedly um, that it was in poor taste. So I guess I don't, I mean, I don't know what I want to <laughs> talk about here. But... So are you telling me that four other people also disparaged Clive Cussler's books um, as yes. part of his death announcement? Uh, so, all right. So three did. And the other one was a little bit of a deep dive article from a couple of years ago. Oh, somehow that came up in my search. And as I was reading, I realized they weren't talking about him being dead. They were just talking about his books. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I was a little upset by that because the guy sold 100 million books and forget how many he sold. Like my thought was like when you sell that many books, somebody's enjoying those books, right? Like Clive Cussler is probably somebody's favorite author. Maybe more than like just somebody, like a lot of people's favorite author, right? Yeah, and I think that all right. So this to me is an insiders versus outsiders uh, kind of view of something, where uh, like Livius, we should talk authors all the time. We have said some garbage things about like you know James Patterson, for example. If James Patterson died tomorrow. We would say nice things about him because that man probably brought more people to reading than anybody else we could think of off the top of our head, with the exception yeah. of maybe like William Shakespeare or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody who does something to advance the craft or encourage people, entice people to read something or to continue to read something or to take that as like a springboard into taking a chance on other stuff needs to be like respected for that regardless of whether you like what they wrote or not that's how i feel about it it's funny that you say that because after like the third article that i found that basically 
um, cited, you know, misogynistic writing. Apparently, I've not read any Clive Custler, so I can't speak for the quality of the books myself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, apparently it was just big titty blondes in every book is sure. the impression I got from these from these articles, you know. I thought to myself, like, fuck, man, if we had to talk about E.L. James dying, we hated her book. We hated it twice. Yeah, yeah we hated it right? two different times. And I would still say, that's yeah, a fucking shame, man. A lot of people really enjoyed that book. Right. You know, so and, and that's how I would treat it. You know, if you're writing a review, that's fine. Tell us why you don't like it. The guy sold over 100 million books, lived to 88, wrote 85 books, most of them probably bestsellers. And yeah. It was just it really rubbed me the wrong way so much so that I, I kind of wanted to mention it here on the podcast, which I guess is fitting because we did talk about a smart water bottle for 20 minutes. So <laughs> I guess a famous author dying could get five minutes <laughs> on the podcast. That's and, and honestly, like, I think that um, I'm not going to blame it on any one thing, but people don't kind of look at the bigger picture of things like they need to is the way that I'm looking at this specific thing because man, if I was a writer and I didn't care much about books, but I got assigned Custler's death announcement for the New York, New York times or whatever, you know, uh, newspaper or magazine or whatever that I happen to be writing for. And all I had, all I did was go through and research, read articles about this person and then basically summarize what people felt about them and use that as my article, yeah, I'd probably say some shitty things about them if if that was the kind of prevailing um, attitude I got out of the stuff that I chose to read. But realistically, like, you have to look at someone who has made such an impact. Like, you go to a used bookstore, you see Patterson all over the place, you see Clive Cussler all over the place, you see John Grisham, you see these names because that's what everybody's reading. And you have to think, even if it has nothing to do with what I care about, there is a significance to that, that like your random, you know, whatever magazine or, or newspaper it has to be person might not have the perspective on, but they, they kind of should if they're writing about that person. Right. So the article I have up, which is the article in question from earlier, um, that the one that you, you told me about, um, <laughs> first of all, the person is <laughs> a senior writer on the obituaries desk. Who started working for this for this establishment in 1961? Whoa! So the person themselves is is uh, right around Clive Cussler's age. Hopefully, <laughs> his obituary will read a little better than this. Sure. Except for the fact, here's where I'm going to shit talk him. Um, Clive Cussler was born in Aurora, Illinois, and that's Aurora, comma I L L period. <sighs> so really, he sold. 100 million books, and this guy doesn't know how to abbreviate Illinois. Um, depending, I mean, here's what I'm going to say. Depending on what style book they use for their publication, that might be appropriate. So, like, if you're using AP style, it's different than, like, other style books. You know what I'm saying? Does that extend to all states? Because I don't remember ever seeing, like, CAL for California. It depends. So, like, uh... Do you want to take it offline and, and figure it out or I, I mean I sure. All right. So we took a we took a minute to to try and figure this out and um uh, we couldn't find anything specifically for the New York Times, but there's, there's a whole Wikipedia on state abbreviations. God is this fucking convoluted. So <laughs> the um uh Andy is apparently what we use which is the the two letters so illinois would be il idaho is id alaska is ak it, it appears that gpo or ap might be what is used by the new york times uh where it's not just three letters so california is calif um, interesting yeah connecticut is c-o-n-n but like Hawaii is just Hawaii and Idaho is just Idaho and Maine is just Maine. Like, it's just like, it, it would seem very difficult to remember which to use. Like Oklahoma is Okla. You, you know what yeah. I mean? But like, yeah. So I, I'm not sure um, what they were using. I mean, I guess I said we wouldn't go say that, but yeah, it's the New York Times. Um, I'm not sure which of these, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six, and an other abbreviations column. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I'm not sure why we couldn't settle on one way. Uh, to be fair, the one is the the ISO, just as US dash, and then the two the two letter one that the you know kind of normal people use. So, um, and for anybody who's listening who doesn't isn't aware, um, there are different style books that are or style kind of standards that are used by different publications, and 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 basically it is a set of rules of how you would do certain things that have to do with spelling, punctuation, grammar, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Associated Press style book, I'm 100% sure, uses two two letter state um, abbreviations, whereas I'm a, I am know for a fact that there are other styles that use three letter state abbreviations. I mean, I guess I understand style books to a certain extent, but goddamn state abbreviations, we can't just agree on that. <laughs> like that that should seem like a malleable like yeah. thing. <laughs> yes, I agree. Like like everybody should just come together in 2012 or whatever and be like, "Hey, I noticed we're all doing this a little bit different. Maybe we can just like land on the government has pretty much like, you know, normalized the idea of if I'm sending a letter to someone, there's a two-letter abbreviation for it." Correct. Why don't we yeah. just go with that? Because that's what the government's doing. No, they they haven't. It'd be hard to sell those style books if you, everyone did it the same way. Maybe maybe I'm thinking of the Wall Street Journal. There's definitely like an old school kind of fancy paper that does three letter abbreviations for states. And it might be the Wall Street Journal because it seems like that's trying to turn its nose up on everybody. So mm-hmm. yeah. I know it might be them. At any rate, wow. I didn't think I didn't think that's where we would get. <laughs> I also didn't think we'd get to an hour. Yeah. This is way more than 32 minutes. We should not review so books more different. often. Yeah, we should not review books. We should just talk about weird tech items that Rob purchases. Yeah. And, uh, and the fucking get into an argument about fucking state abbreviations, <laughs> for fuck's sake. <laughs> Which is like the least important thing about that article. Um, yeah. Yeah. It just caught my articles. eye. Yeah. It, 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 I, I'm sure it only caught my eye because I've lived my whole life in Illinois. I'm sure anybody else would scroll right past that and not give it a second thought. Yep. Yeah. Um, <sighs> tell the folks what's happening next week. Yeah. Remember when I said, hey, the book we're reading next week and then you stopped me? <laughs> yes, I do that's, remember. That's why we're at where we're at right now. So um, I am about uh, I'm knee deep in reading the book, The Deep by Al Makatsu. That was an accidental pun. Apologies for that, um, which we will be reviewing on. Uh, next uh, this coming episode, I guess, but we also have uh, something exciting else that's going on with that. An interview with Al Makatsu, also dropping the same week. Maybe yeah, so, even right at the same time. Yeah, so you're going to get a full interview episode and a full review episode um, at the same time. The nice thing about that is, uh, in the past year, like we mentioned earlier in the episode, we read The Hunger by Al Makatsu, so we'll have more than just the, the deep to talk about but uh, i know in the previous episode we were talking about how this book had to do with the titanic and now that i'm reading it like it's funny like <laughs> thinking back to our conversation where livius jived and in, dove into the book without knowing um what the book was about just assuming it was about the titanic so mm-hmm. it's it's pretty funny yeah um i'm about halfway i know rob's getting close to halfway uh, looking forward to talking about this one and i'm really looking forward to talking about al makatsu i have some questions about writing historical fiction yeah and who better to to throw those questions at than somebody who is uh become uh, apparently um very uh, accomplished in doing so yeah and if you think about it all the way back on like the sixth episode of the podcast remember when we accidentally read a nonfiction book yeah so I like do. we got that eric larson dude who's writing like he wrote um devil in the white city he wrote in the Garden of Beasts, which we uh, reviewed, and he basically does that type of thing where it's like a very narratively structured nonfiction book, mm-hmm. as opposed to a very fiction book that is adapted from a historical element. And so far, I think I like the fiction approach more than the narrative nonfiction approach. I'm 100% with you. I've read other historical fiction, and I've always kind of felt that way. So, um, but yeah, I'm really excited to talk to her. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for 2020. <laughs> I can't. I just can't. <laughs> I know. I, I I was composing a message to Rob about how I'd started the book. 
but I was only like a shallow way into it, and I was like, I can't do it. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna send it to him. You saved it for the podcast. I appreciate uh, sh- that. Shallow end of the book. Yeah. We're, listen, get it out of your system, dude. Because we're totally not gonna say shit like that while we're on with <laughs> with Mrs. Katsu. So I'm telling you right now, get it out of your system. All right. I don't. I can't think of a better way to wrap up this episode. Uh, until next week when we do a review and interview uh, with Alma Katsu. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading.